Um, thank you to Michael, Tina, Elaine, and the CAS team for the invitation to present the research. Can you hear me at the back okay? Yeah, okay. Um, in societies emerging out of uh, political conflict, and certainly in the case of Northern Ireland, there is a, a general acceptance that storytelling, or as Stromit House called it, oral history, is one way of addressing the legacy of the past. Um, there have been a number of reports, uh, government sanctioned reports, the um, Bloomfield report, 98, the um, Eames Bradley report, and more recently the Haas O'Sullivan report. And amongst the many recommendations, the one that's consistent is an oral history archive. Um, in Northern Ireland, there has been no official support for this. None of these have been taken up by the Stormont Assembly uh, or previously the Northern Ireland office. And in that vacuum, a number of community and civic uh, initiatives have taken place. And you probably know some of them. There are about 50 over the last period of time. Uh, two of the better known ones are um, accounts of the conflict at Ulster University that received Peace 3 funding. Um, Healing Through Remembering has a storytelling network which um, accesses a number of community-based storytelling projects. And Anduchas in West Belfast has done work in the Falls Road but also with the Shankill Road. They're the most well-known. Um, I'm involved in another one, Prisons Memory Archive. And I was hoping that some of the, I suppose, insights that we've gained, the lessons we've learned, the mistakes we've made, as well as the successes we've achieved, might be of benefit to the proposed oral history archive and the Stromit House Agreement. Um, we chose the prisons and we chose Armagh Jail and the Maison Long Cache because they were the two, I suppose, most significant uh, prisons for sentenced prisoners. Of course, Crumlin Road Belfast Prison operated as a remand centre and McGilligan for short term. Um, but we focused on those two first of all. And we did so because it offered a number of possibilities for us. Um, the first one is that the prison story is iconic during the Troubles. What happened inside affected what happened outside. One could make the argument that the hunger strikes created the basis for a turning point so that the, the militarism of the Republican movement became a political uh, movement. Um, but also, I think the prisoners played an absolutely critical role in the peace process. As you know, Mo Molum uh, went into, I think she was the first Secretary of State to go in and talk to prisoners. And she negotiated with loyalist prisoners during the uh, period before the Belfast Agreement of 1998. Um, also, given the scale of these prisons, um, their impact on society was enormous. It is reckoned about 25,000 prisoners went through the men's, maize and long cash prison. It is a guesstimate that about 15,000 prison officers worked in that one prison. So you can imagine the scale if you think to multiply relatives, families, etc. into those numbers. So for us it was an important, certainly not the most important story, but one of the important stories if we could tell that story. But also as filmmakers, what it offered um, was the opportunity to have a thematic and a physical frame around the story. What happened inside those four walls was crucial for us. And as filmmakers, we didn't have to go outside of those four walls. I suppose it's worth saying at this point, um, one of the stimulants for us to, to, to work on this was the idea of when you start to describe a memory, it changes qualitatively when you do it at the site of the experience. And we found many of the participants that we worked with said, um, it's amazing what you remember when you come back in here. This isn't always going to be an opportunity for people in collecting oral history. But in our case, because the prisons were emptied, we had taken a number of years to negotiate first with the NIO and then the executive, and then, of course, the constituent groups as well, to get access and to get their permission to take part. 
So we got the funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund. What we hadn't realised up until that point was that the Heritage Lottery Fund deal in digital, non-material culture, not just physical buildings. And we were very lucky that at that particular time they were open to the idea of discussing how we might address the legacy of the past. And so they funded us in the year 2006 to go into Armagh Jail and 2007 into the Maison Long Cash Prison. And our methodology was... I suppose fairly simple. Some of us have come from television and we started off by deciding that it would be a conversation with the person uh, or two people. They, they were, the vast majority of the 175 people who contributed came on their own. Some came with a relative, some came with a number of people, but almost all <coughs> came just by themselves. And we decided that we wanted a conversation and so it was a relatively intimate relationship we wanted. We didn't want the lights, we didn't want the boom, we didn't want a crew, we wanted a conversation. And so with radio mics and a camera, a camera operator went out with each individual around the site. Um, but before that, and this is something I suppose what I'll return to in the recommendations, we, we sat down with each participant beforehand and asked them what they wanted to talk about. We took 15 minutes to brief and explain what we were doing and they would explain to us what they wanted to talk about. And at the end of the recording, we took 15 minutes to sit down and work out what it was like for you. Um, we also offered every one of the 175 one counselling session, which had been paid for by the Heritage Lottery Fund. And we also asked the crew to attend a half-day event where they would work with a counsellor about the notion of transference. As you know, these were very violent prisons. And so we wanted, in a sense, the camera operators to be involved in what oral historians call deep listening. They want, we wanted them to be present. Um, but the more you make yourself vulnerable, the more you are to possibly feeling the trauma of the other person. And so we had someone work with a camera crew for half a day. Um, the protocols. These probably are the most important things I think that we would pass on to other people and we've learned them ourselves as filmmakers. We've learned from anthropology, we've learned from oral history and it was interesting in the very first presentation about the notion of co-production of knowledge. I think having worked in television and having run into a few problems with Channel 4's lawyers about recording Billy Hutchinson many, many years ago, we realised that... Um, what television does is it takes your story. It's a, it's a political economy. It's not a blame thing. Television takes your story and you sign away your rights to that story at the point of recording. And you go off and you edit and you make another story. And we, we know that many people, and there was one particular prison officer said to us um, who was reluctant to take part, I was interviewed once for television and I didn't recognise myself on the screen. And the reason he said that was because of editing. And I've done that myself. You've under pressure from commissioning editors to make a particular film with a particular narrative and you shape the material into that narrative. We knew that this was uh, a problem for many of the participants and that as one of the most photographed societies in the Western Hemisphere at the time, many people were reluctant to come forward. So we offered co-ownership, which means that they co-own the material and they can withdraw it at any point. Uh, that's got rewards and risks. The rewards are that prison officers came on board. The risks are that when someone, uh, when David Black was shot dead four years ago, a prison officer, uh, two prison officers phoned up and said, take us out. We don't want anything to do with this project. We have reached an agreement where we will return to them in about 10 years, so we have a moratorium on that. They might agree to continue the moratorium, have it released publicly, or completely destroyed. But that... Withdrawal means that we still have 18 prison officers in the project. So the co-ownership is very time-consuming and may not be applicable to the oral history archive, given the scale of it. But for us, it absolutely underpins everything that we do. Uh, the second protocol is um, inclusivity. As you know from the withdrawal of funding for the reconciliation uh, International Reconciliation Centre at the Maison Long Cache. The, one, of the, one of the issues there was that this would be a memorial to terrorism. The story of the prisons is regarded in the public mind often as a Republican narrative. We wanted to open that up. 
Um, and so we have prison officers, we have loyalists, we have chaplains, artists, teachers, maintenance workers, doctors, etc. That was really important for us. And, and the other reason is that if we are going to move forward as a society, we have to hear sometimes uncomfortable versions of the past. We have to allow our own beliefs and perceptions to be questioned. And I think a mature, a mature society is able to do that. You don't have to agree with the other person to give them space to tell their story. And the third one is life storytelling, which follows on from um, co-ownership. It returns agency. We don't ask leading questions. Boston College, I think, is a really good example of how not to do an oral history archive. And for us, we kind of knew that from before, that you want those people you're talking with to have control over their own narrative. And another interesting aspect of that is that um, if you read some of the psychoanalytic material on trauma, um, one, I think it's Renis Papadopoulos, a uh, psychoanalyst in London, worked with Bosnian concentration camp survivors, said, if you, because people's narratives are fragmented by trauma, one way of helping them put it back is simply to ask them to tell the story of what happened. And that helps to stitch together a narrative of one's identity. And so while we're not clinically trained, we wanted to do no harm. And life storytelling was part of that aspect. Um, iterations. I'm going to show you a clip because over 10 years, we have found it very difficult to get any more funding. Um, we have released material in bits and pieces. We have 175 interviews. We have 300 hours of material. Some people took half an hour to walk around the site. Some people took four hours to walk around the site. There were two Republican ex-prisoners in Armagh jail because we had the keys to the jail, the jail. We had to kick them out, and they said it was the very first time they were kicked out of a prison in their lives. Um, and so how do you make this material available? We, we, when we filmed it, we filmed it for an archive, not for films. But because of the lack of funding, we got funding for PhD scholarships and a number of students have worked on and produced our two particular films. And if anyone is interested in getting these films, we can send them to you if you can promise to put them in the public sphere, a library or whatever. One is on the role of women in a men's prison called We Were There. And the second one is on the women's prison itself, Our Mass Stories. And the third iteration from the funding is the Community Relations Council allowed us to put about 25 up online. And I want to show you a clip from one of those. And the reason I'm choosing this one is John Hetherington is a prison officer. And they're one of the most kind of sensitive constituencies to this whole story. Um, we had more refusals than we had acceptances. And John is interesting in this particular aspect because he's about to go into the hospital wing where 10 hunger strikers died. And for him, he's talking about the memory process itself, which I think is really interesting. These aren't, often these stories are as much about the present as they are about the past. Okay. This is the prison hospital, um, which is, for better or worse, uh, being preserved. I have mixed feelings about it myself. I can understand why some people would want to keep it basically the way it is, and I could also understand why other people think it should be simply removed. I have mixed feelings about it. Um, it's quite emotional actually being here. It's a little un unsettling and a little ghostly perhaps. Um, the whole world knows really what happened here. Um, there were very strange times very emotional times. The times that I think were spent in a very detached mental attitude. It was difficult not to feel, um, you know, human pity for the, for what was happening here, or perhaps even some sympathy. But at the same time, one had to um, carry on with one's duty and try not to think too much. Thinking was the enemy at all times. It didn't mean that we were mindless morons at all, but it just meant that. Well, when you're dealing with issues like this, especially emotive issues like this, it's perhaps best just to try and, if humanly possible, remain a little detached. Um, I wasn't always able to achieve that, of course. But I certainly felt a great deal of pity and sympathy 
especially for the relatives that we met from time to time here. It makes me sad, um, very sad, when I think of what happened. Um, I know hindsight and, and history have a wonderful way of putting things in, context, in context, but when I actually look back and think of what, you know, what happened here at that particular time, how emotions were highly charged, positively, negatively, it's a time I've never really been able to come to terms with. Uh, it's a time I've never really visited that often actually in my own mind. It's a place that I remember really at the periphery of my memory rather than actually go back there in the ways that I, I do visit some places. I'm going to stop it there because we're, time's running out, but this is available online and you can go into the Prison's Memory Archive, go to the Maze London. Okay, prison, go to places, John Hetherington Hospital uh, for that. And I want to talk now about, in a sense, how this material is used because there is no point in having an archive unless there's an impact, in a sense. And we have had uh, successes and we've had some difficulties. The film Arma Stories, I suppose the comparison in the two films is that we were there, the women in the men's prison. Those women had more in common. The uh, artists, teachers, the um, visitors, both Republican and Loyalist, all talked about the sensation of being a woman in a male environment. So that film actually produced quite interesting debates and discussions and all 12 women turned up to the premiere at the Belfast Film Festival a couple of years and took part in the discussion. The second film on Arma Stories is more difficult. It's more painful because it's cold face. There are prison officers who had colleagues killed. There are prisoners who faced strip searching. It's a more difficult film to watch and we have had therefore quite different responses and I think this is something... Um, that needs to be addressed when you're thinking of showing material like this. And I'll give two, two examples. One is to um, a women's group. We've actually shown it to two cross-community women's groups. And what was really interesting about the responses afterwards, we only show it to, on invitation, apart from film festivals. And both the community leaders in the two areas of East Belfast and West Belfast thought that this would create a space for the groups to talk about the past. And in one particular case, it was a relatively new group operating about a year, and they had talked about current issues, important issues, schooling, uh, jobs, etc. She wanted to open up a discussion of the past. And what happened was that the woman in the uh, cross-community group used the opportunity of the film to create a space where they talked about their own personal stories. They didn't talk about anything that had happened in the film. Um, as a filmmaker, that wasn't particularly um, damaging to me because it created a positive, safe space for them to talk about their relatives, their friends who had been imprisoned, who had been shot, etc., etc. The second one was um, at risk still of having created more damage than actually success. It was a group of ex-service personnel UDR, RUC, prison officers. And the chair of that group had seen the film and thought this would be a good opportunity. He wanted them to start telling their stories. He found they, there was a need there, but they were very reluctant. So he's, he thought, here's a good case study. Um, and the reason that it was difficult was because, although our mass stories has got two prison, female prison officers in the film, it also has a number of Republicans, primarily Republicans, because Loyalist women did not join paramilitaries. And what the, the, the people present in the room saw was the Republicans talking about their successful campaign. They didn't hear what the prison officers were saying, and they were both hurt and angry. And they were very angry because they felt they had been left behind by history. Because the very people that had risked their lives to imprison were now up there, they pointed to here, were in Stormont. And we left that meeting feeling that that group was not ready to hear that, that film, to hear those stories, and that the chairperson who had seen it had misjudged, and we should have shown them the other film, which is a, a gentler film in some ways. Um, so for recommendations, because I know we're coming to the end, um, in our situation, which is not directly related 
relatable to all other oral history projects, particularly the one in Stormont House, given the scale of it, is a, is a, is a degree of co-ownership. Maybe at some point that co-ownership could end, but there must be the right of people giving their story to see the edited final version before it goes public. And must must be explained to them how it's going to be used. About 40% of our participants do not want it uh, ever to be seen uh, on the internet or on broadcast. They only want it in a building. And I suppose I forgot to say that the, the difficulty getting funding has ended. We have now got a very large funding and partnership with the Public Record Office for all the archive to be moved over there. It'll probably take about a year's time. But up to 40-50% of the participants are very 100% want it in a building, but 40 or 50% do not want it on the internet. So we're going to have two exhibition spaces. One is in the public record office and then for a lesser number um, on the internet. Inclusivity, the range is absolutely uh, uh, crucial and I think it's already written into some of the text that's been prepared for the Stormont House Agreement. Life storytelling, work with the participants in terms of what the narrative, what they want to say, because what they do not want to say is as important and needs to be respected. Um, preservation, I think already the Public Record Office has been identified as one of the possible outlets, but wherever it is, preservation is actually extremely costly and needs to be paid attention to. Accessibility and engagement. In other words, how is it going to be used? Is it going to be brought into school curriculums? Are packages going to be created for it? Etc. But also that whole question of reception that I touched on with the ex-service personnel. That's very sensitive material. Um, and then finally, governance. We have a governance system whereby the participants sit on the management committee. It's open to all 175. We took the Occupy movement's ethos of whoever turns up makes the decision. And touch. Is that plastic? Um, it's worked for us so far. Um, obviously, with time passing, people will pass away. But at the moment, there's a number of constituencies come regularly to meetings and help us make strategic key decisions. Okay, thank you.